Okay. So, David Engels, thanks very much once again for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation. Looking forward to the second part of our discussion. So, yeah, in the, the first part, we discussed uh, Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West, Volume 1, Form and Actuality. Um, and in this episode, as people will imagine, we're going to discuss the second volume, Perspectives of World History. Um, now, one thing I would say about these, I mean, I always reiterate this with any conversation, is that no hour to an hour and a half long conversation is really going to cover a, a philosophical or a theoretical work. Now, that applies to, to most of them, but it applies especially to Decline of the West, which when you read it, uh, it's, it's, it's a real unfortunate uh, trait of history, I guess, that it's basically been pushed aside in its entirety as this um, fascism light or just a right wing reactionary work, which people read because they, I don't know, you know, this, this sort of forbidden book. When mm -hmm. you, re you read it and it is astoundingly uh, complex, astoundingly well-researched and um, a book which somehow manages to tackle sort of every major form of uh, theorization, you know, from tradition, m man and mas uh, male and female, um, states, nations, races, you know, everything you could sort of imagine. Spengler's got a little section in there for it. Um, so you you mentioned um, in the first discussion that you sort of have a preference for volume two. Um, why is this? Yeah, well, on, on, on the one hand, it's, it's certainly linked to the fact that volume one essentially deals with uh, more ter stuff such as mathematics, Partly also art history, where he goes fairly detailed into different aspects of Renaissance and Baroque art. And the, the political aspect, uh, on the one hand, is missing a little bit, and it's, it's very historical. So it's not an analysis about what is happening in the 19th or 20th century West. It's really uh, a comparison between, well, essentially uh, classical uh, Greek and Roman mathematics with Western mathematics and uh, of different aspects of, of art history. And now this is, of course, very interesting. Uh, I always felt a bit more um, more interested by the more political aspects of the second volume, which, as I said, deals with Spengler's present and the events immediately leading leading up to it and uh, comparing that with other periods in, in, in world history. So that is, of course, one aspect. But what also needs to be said, perhaps also to, to, to the public, is that um, uh, Spengler's decline of the West is 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 not an is not easy to read, and not uh, because of um, uh, an intricate argumentation like in Kant, where if 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 you miss one sentence, suddenly you 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 don't get it back somehow, and you are you are lost in the argumentation, as there's one one step in this mathematical construction that is somehow somehow missing. So in Kant, you can't just skip a chapter and 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 uh, start uh, at another place without really missing something. Basically, in, in Spengler, it's really different because uh, even though there are of course some major aspects or some some major light motifs that appear in different chapters, it, it is an, 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 an amazingly unsystematic book for for such a systematic thinker uh, it, it it is really associative it, it springs all the time it is not at all uh, complete so many civilizations like essentially the the old indian civilization and many parts also um, of the of the uh, mexican uh, civilization are, are, are nearly missing also ancient babylonia doesn't really appear apart from a couple of sentences here and there and here and there so it's 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 very unsystematic everything is a bit distributed everywhere but th that has the advantage that basically you can open this book on whatever page you like and read 10 pages without really having missed something fundamental that, that comes from before. But it's, of course, also a, a frustrating experience. And I would say that, of course, every reader who has read the, the introduction, so the first 60 or so, so pages, basically has understood everything. If you read this introduction, if you look at the comparative tables, you, you understood more or less what it is about, and you can start and finish any chapter wherever you 
would like to uh, without being too much disturbed. So that, that, that's a bit my, my, my take on, on, on these two volumes and the introduction. It's, uh, it's a curious reading and it's, it's also understandable if you look, of course, at the, the genesis of Spengler's Decline of the West, which, uh, which uh, stemmed from, from hundreds, if not thousands of little aphorisms and, and, and mini paragraphs he, wo he, he wrote on, on, on slips of paper and which he then systematized and condensed into this book, which is still pretty much composed of, of, of or, or characterized by a very aphoristic style. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned at the beginning the, the, the controversial nature of Decline of the West. And this really, as I understand it, is down to, to volume two. Uh, what, why is that? Yeah, as I said, volume one is still fairly apolitical. Uh, there's this introduction, okay, but it's still quite short and it's, it's not necessarily uh, filled with, with passion or at least political passion. Uh, we have also to think that that volume one had been written still during the First World War, so in a context where the political system was still stable and where Spengler um, was writing yeah, in the middle of an, of an imperial state of Wilhel late Wilhelminian uh, uh, Germany. Whereas volume two uh, was written, or at least at least published then notably, uh, under the Weimar Republic. And uh, of course, is a testimony to the um, destruction of this old uh, Wilhelminian, late Victorian, you could say, German uh, German society, the political chaos that ensued, the attempts of 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 um, uh, creating from scratch, you could say, a democratic state in 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 Germany, much resisted against by by most most by many many people and uh, many many classes also of population, and of course Spengler reflects this this uh, sentiment and. Uh, deals a lot with political issues and uh, obviously does not belong at all to uh, this uh, progressist uh, teleological historical school um, thinking that history is the uh, or is characterized by the evolution of uh, liberalism democracy freedom equality and so forth uh, spengler is uh, as the as the listeners may may, may remember uh, more of a cyclical thinker or, or at least a biological thinker for whom all major civilization uh, de uh, develop uh, in basically in par parallel to, to, to each other. So all go through basically morphologically the same, the same steps. And uh, so history in itself does not have a major, major objective. It's, it's history is rather the sum of the individual histories of these different uh, different cultures and so for Spengler of course the Weimar Republic is not the, the goal of German or European or world history tending to any form of democracy but just the transitional state situated more or less at the end of Western civilization uh, and ultimately not really being a democracy in the liberal uh, leftist understanding but rather some form of disguised plutocracy, oligarchy that inevitably must lead to Caesarism, which is more or less the last step before the end of any civilization. And so Spengler sees, of course, that this evolution is inevitable. So he doesn't necessarily judge this, but he, he, he is simply, simply, simply um, remarks that we have these, these similar evolutions in, in every civilization and that thus also this Weimar democracy is just a transitional state. Um, and, and of course, this has been considered as, as highly anti-democratic, uh, illiberal, as some form of conscious or unconscious justification of fascism, as, as uh, Spengler believed that Mussolini was one of the first prototype of this Caesarism that in analogy to the Caesarism of the late Roman Republic would also affect Western civilization. So Spengler had developed also some, well, we can say that honestly, some form of sympathy also for, for Italian fascism as being more or less what future would be about. He was not the only one, of course, in, in believing that. And so out of all that, uh, there, there, there has been 
well, ma many readers uh, develop this this idea of Spengler as a as a proto-fascist, illiberal uh, thinker, and and so forth. That is, of course, also strongly linked to his style. He is a Nietzschean thinker, so he is a, very obviously an, 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 an uh, elitist thinker for whom what is really interesting in history are some elites, are some aristocracies who really act, who shape history, whereas the large masses basically uh, just um, are, are victims of history. And he doesn't really express any form of sympathy, or at least if he does, it is it is well hidden within the decline. So of course, this 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 elitism, uh, and this this determinism is also being criticized by by the left as being a testimony to his uh, anti humanism and so forth. And that, that is not uh, that is not absolutely wrong. Also, I think that a book like the decline of the West could have been written with more pity for the victims of history. Without this triumphalist attitude, it's only the strong who win. That's a tragedy, but that's how it is. And we have to accept it. That is more or less Spengler's gist. He could have said the same with saying, well, it's it's a tragedy for all these good people downtrodden, but um, yeah, it's it's unavoidable. So it's also a question of style and uh, all that has, 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 has led to this uh, condemnation of, uh, of, uh, of essentially the second volume. And, and perhaps something we also should not forget is that the first volume, when it first appeared, was written in a much more scholarly style than we know it today. Uh, because when Spengler published the second volume, he also published a revised edition of the first volume, which is the one everyone reads by now. And this, this changes he, um, he, he brought to the first volume are not so much changes in content, but rather in style. So he basically scrapped everything that sounded a bit too scholarly, formulated that in his own a bit more dictatorial, easy to read style. And so it's the, the, the difference for the readers in Spengler's time who first read this more scholarly version of the first volume, and then this much more politically and passionate and engaged second volume had the impression also of a greater rift between both than we who read the second volume in combination with the revised version of the of the first volume, which hints much more stylistically also at at the second one. So that that makes it perhaps more understandable why many why many scholars welcomed the first volume because they perceived it as an academic volume and were then dis disturbed by the style of the second volume and started to politicize also Spengler's own attitude. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for, so for Spengler, I mean, is there, perhaps we touched on this a little bit in the first conversation, but is there any sort of connective tissue between, you know, so history itself is condensed into just these cultures of uh, high cultures, basically. Uh, is there any connective t tissue between them or is that sort of a, a no man's land? It is uh, a land of misunderstanding, I think Spengler would have said. Of, of course, there are contacts between between civilizations, between civilizations living at the same time, uh, who, who coexist in, 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 in time and space, and of course have their inter interaction, like ancient Egypt and ancient Babylonia who interact, or like, uh, uh, like uh, for example, the early Western civilization with the late uh, Muslim civilization. So there are areas of contact. Of course, there is also a phenomenon of reception between long bygone civilizations and much later civilizations who discover their, their heritage and somehow try to, to, to integrate that into their, their own uh, um, wealth or their own evolution like 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 the western civilization who uh, um, is is uh, regularly looking back at classical antiquity and trying to to be inspired by 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 this information so there there, there are spaces between uh, these civilizations but they are not really spaces of exchange for spengler there's spaces of misunderstanding as every civilization uh, uh, either misunderstands 
another one. So it reads its text, it looks at its 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 works of art, but it it is only capable of perceiving them through its own lens and only uh, perceives them through that. And that's why Spengler once said there are, in fact, there's not one Aristotle, but three Aristotles. There's a real Greek Aristotle, then there is the, the, the Muslim reception of Aristotle, which gives rise to a completely different personality in many respects. And then there's the third one, Western or the Faustian reception of Aristotle, which also is very far from the from the original Aristotle. And we could perhaps also say that another example, which seems perhaps also more obvious to us uh, today, is if you compare the the real uh, ancient classical Indian figure of Buddha in the context of of of, of uh, 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 Hindu philosophy uh, on the one hand. And then the Chinese and Japanese reception of Buddha, which makes Buddhism becoming something absolutely different from what Buddha himself probably in, in, intended in his Indian, Indian context. So Spengler certainly has a point there. Uh, and the other aspect, of course, is that not only we only see other civilizations through our own lens, but also we consciously choose just those elements which can fit within our own frame of mind and just leave the others be if we can't do anything for anything from 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 that for example um this becomes also very obvious even to today's research if you look at the uh, uh, muslim uh, arab reception of classical antiquity where we can see that classical philosophy, mathematics, medicine, and so forth, were very eagerly uh, consulted and translated into Arabian and adapted because there were much more <coughs> practical elements that could be easily integrated. Whereas, for example, classical Greek history or historiography has been absolutely left out by, by, by Muslim scholarship. So uh, in these huge translation schools in, in Baghdad or in, in, in Cairo, uh, they translated uh, a wealth of information from classical Greek, but nobody had, any, had, had had the idea of translating things like Thucydides, Herodotus, Livy, or so forth. And that, that led, of course, also to the fact that for, for a Muslim scholar, uh, reading Plato's Republic or Aristotle's uh, um, um, politics with uh, their numerous allusions to contemporary Greek history must have been absolutely inunderstandable in, in because this reference to, to Pericles, to democracy, to the, to the Peloponnesian War and all these things must have been, as I said, not understandable. And so that is that is Spengler's takes on take on what happens between civilizations. The only thing where he really sees some form of true interaction or at least com continuity is, of course, when it comes to the reception of purely uh, material elements, such as the, the the invention of the wheel, for example. Uh, this, this, this becomes then, once it is invented, some form of, at least in, in, in Eurasia, one form of, of, of continuity between civilizations or the invention of writing or, or alphabets who also transit from one civilization to the other, some, some basic uh, discoveries, of course. So, so they can be taken over uh, and developed and, and continue without being necessarily misunderstood or absolutely distorted so there are some forms of of continuity but we would say that this only happens on a very uh, superficial level or let's say on a level that doesn't touch the inner and spiritual evolution of these different civilizations so i'm going to assume that for spengler those three aristotles have to happen there's not really any chance that the, the real aristotle could be used in the real sense in another <laughs> civilization. Yeah, only only Spengler himself makes an exception, of course. Um, but that, but that's perhaps a bit uh, um, not 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 kind to say. Uh, as many many contemporaries have 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 reproached or have tried to single out what they perceived as as an, an inner contradiction. On the one hand, you have this philosopher who says that basically no civilization can understand the other really truly from the within. And then the same philosopher tries to show exactly how they work. 
everyone even from, from the within so many people have said that's an that's an inner contradiction but in in, in fact of course if if we are honest it it isn't so um I mean, we, we, we see even from our own experience that, uh, of course, if we invest many, many years, even decades in the study of the language, the history, the mentality of another civilization, and of course, we start to understand it better and better step by step. And who knows that perhaps after 30 years or 40 years of studying Chinese and living in China, a Westerner may be indeed be, be, be capable of, of understanding it more or less from, from, from the within. But such an effort is, of course, not something that everyone can, can, can make uh, and try to do that for every other civilization. So this must remain, of course, quite an exception. And even uh, without totally understanding one civilization from the within, um, only because of some interest or some first interest and then we can already start to have a first gist of what it may feel like to be part of that civilization and that that is basically what spengler does he invests enormous amount of time in, in understanding what uh, what the muslim civilization classical civilization the chinese civilization is about from the within uh, but of course he never would would, would claim that he that he thus became a Chinese and feels like a Chinese from the inside. Uh, he just sees that through the literature, there are these hints that suggest that uh, one basic feeling might be this or the soul image of one civilization might be, might be something different. Uh, and he, he compares that and singles that out, but he would never uh, pretend that he is now so well integrated into ancient China that he would be able now to to write himself uh, a poem that would be fit into the poetry of the uh, late of uh, uh, early early Han Dynasty. So this this apparent um, this apparent inner contradiction is not really a contradiction if we look at it from a more realistic point of view. Mm -hmm. And these these cultures that we're talking about, which for you know for Spengler create history, but are equally their own histories. Uh, within their own sort of spheres of history, they are put into contrast with primitive, primitive culture and high cultures. Um, and high cultures are the ones, of course, that sh which you know uh, have these aristocracies, which build these great histories, such as Rome, etc. Um, so, what is a primitive culture? Are these almost sort of useless for Spengler? Hmm. Well, one could say that even the high cultures are useless from, from Spengler's point of view. There is no, no higher aim. They, they do not lead to something. Uh, as I said, Spengler is not, um, is not a teleological uh, thinker. There is no, no aim in history, neither positive nor negative. So for him, history as a total doesn't lead to the fulfillment of any progress, of, of all progress that is imaginable. But it doesn't lead also to absolute disaster and the apocalypse. No, it's it's neither, I could say, declinist and Christian, nor is it progressist and 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 leftist. You could say from from that point of view, it is it is a cyclical, uh, comparative uh, uh, approach towards history. And the the ultimate aim, finally, or the, at least Spengler says that is 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 a mystery. We do not know what its aim is, and the aim, finally, or rather the sense. Uh, of history is finally purely aesthetical. So it is it is beautiful what is created by mankind and these different endeavors by these different civilizations to develop all their potential by going through these different stages until they decline at the end. This is essentially an aesthetical spectacle that can make you wonder about what life is about. Uh, Spengler being a, uh, being a vitalist philosopher, trying to understand better the aim of your own life, as it is also in parallel with these civilizations. But there is not a, a vulgar uh, lesson to be learned in order to make something better than, 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 than the others. Uh, you can't learn a lesson. Uh, studying the, the, the for, I mean, uh, studying medicine, doesn't give you the lesson of how to avoid or, or to make death, death impossible. You can learn how to stay perhaps healthy and so forth, but you can't uh, suddenly say, and thanks to this now, uh, the, the rules of life uh, change totally. And after old age, we have again uh, the, 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 the young age and things like that. And when, when it comes to, that, that, that shows also the difference 
worked uh, with uh, the uh, primitive um, cultures. I'm not even sure if Spengler would have used the word culture uh, um, to describe them. For, for him, it's rather an ahistorical state of different societies, uh, people and so forth, who of course have all their, their destiny, they also fight their wars, they build their towns or at least uh, villages, there is some form of up and down also in their, in their history, there might even be some, some inventions here and there, but it, it is not in a uh, closed uh, cycle of, of evolution. It is it is ahistorical. He, on, one, on one point, he says that the history of the Germanic tribes before the Roman conquest uh, is as interesting as the the life of different aunt or B uh, people. So they, they yes, they, they of course they evolve. They have their destiny, but there is no real real sense behind that. There is no no intrinsic logic. They are not in the part of this thousand year or long process which starts at a certain point. It's a mystery why, and which then inevitably goes through all the stages of evolution until this 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 course uh, of of civilization is finished and you could even say spengler spengler himself didn't didn't say that of course but you, you could even take the decline of the west and read it not as an idealization of high high cultures but even as the contrary, you can even understand high culture as some form of virus uh, that uh, creates a thousand year long logic where the human being is not free anymore as it is subjected to this cultural state created by his society and everything goes along a predestined logic you can't escape. Whereas one could argue people living outside of this uh, cultural evolution, be it before or be it after, are in some way freer because they are not subjected to the pressure of this the, the cultural stage they live in. They can do basically whatever they want without being being a victim of, of history. Of course, Spengler doesn't say that, but I'm just showing that you can take this Spenglerian approach and, and turn it upside down, and it still 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 is valid. But you can interpret it, of course, in a in a radically different way also. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to assume he wasn't a religious man. Yeah, uh, no, we very spoke about clearly. This last time. Yeah, very clearly. Very, very clearly not a religious man. Um, I mean, there is some belief in, or, or rather, his his main belief is on in the principle of life. So there is some form of dualism, you could say. You have unorganic, unorganic principle of matter that follows logic somehow. Then you have the organic principle that is life which follows the cycle so this of course strongly based on on schopenhauer on nietzsche so it's in the continuation of this so i guess that for spengler life itself must have been certainly a, a wonderful principle more important than just pure metal like in in materialist marxist uh, thought so life of course is Perhaps not a transcendent pattern, but clearly one that is not purely materialist for, 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 for Spengler. But there is not necessarily a belief in any form of personal God or afterlife or things like that uh, expressed in the decline and nothing like that also in his, in his correspondence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, I mean, you know, of course, that's something which, um, as you say, you know, you can take it either as you it's not understood in a positive or negative sense this form of history it just is you're within a culture you you're either of that culture and this and 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 i guess in a certain sense if you're in the beginning stages of a culture or the mid the mid uh the summer of a culture you're somewhat lucky your, your purpose and meaning in life is fairly clear um if you're at the later stages then your purpose and meaning is still clear but it's in a negative sense it's a, your sort of your purpose and meaning is is you know on the downward slope but of course, the thing that really interests me in this volume is this notion of you either belong to a high culture or you're simply a, a human in general, a human type in general, as Spengler says, a historyless man, um, which which sort of, it begs firstly the question, right, I would argue that if you're part of a high culture, if you're, if you're a, a Roman citizen in the, in the, high, the, 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 the high season in Rome, you sort of know what to do intuitively or instinctively, right? You you are that. If you're a historyless man, if you're you have you know history less, 
what do you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. He uses this word of uh, of of fella, no, this this uh, plural fellahin, so the, the 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 Arab term for the uh, Egyptian peasant leaving, uh, living living uh, after the fall of the pharaohs. Where basically Egyptian life uh, continues even after Egypt has lost its autonomy. So the the, the seasons, there's the Nile to be to be dealt with. Um, you you sow, you reap, you 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 live, you have children, you 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 pay your 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 taxes and whatever to the dynasty or the other people in charge uh, but nothing is really progressing from the from the inside so it's 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 hollow somehow from a morphological point of view it's out of out of history and um, that is a, a feeling of course that uh, i think we already start to see around us even to, especially today i would say in the in the modern west where increasing parts of our civilization have stopped to feel in any form of solidarity with their own history, with their culture, with their tradition. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I often use that example, but uh, when 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 I when I try to explain to my students um, society, for example, of of of, of 19th century uh, Britain or something like that, for for them that is more or less on the same. Uh, level as when i'm talking about the aztecs or the uh the, the ancient or the, the, the chinese it's it's old history it doesn't doesn't uh, appeal to them it's not their own past they do not claim this heritage as their own they do not see that as an obligation it's something to be taken over to be assumed positively and negatively to be transmitted to their children if if they have any of course <laughs> rather uh, it is it is uh, it is it is not even perceived as a burden anymore but as something absolutely really strange that doesn't affect them their history starts at best with 1989 perhaps just with their own birth uh, or the everything that is before is already ancient history and so they do not have an, an aim in life they are not religious or at least not in organized form so they they, they try to, to, to construct their own semi-esoteric and naive thing, uh, belief, uh, explaining why it is good to be nice to other people. That is, that is I think, an, uh, uh, already uh, an exception. And most just want to survive. They want to, to, to earn some money, have some fun, consume things, but there's nothing, nothing beyond. These people are not ready to, to die for a cause or to suffer or to make to make sacrifices. I mean, because many people would say, well, okay, uh, uh, just trying to survive and enjoying life, that's a human constant. But they would say, no, it, it, it isn't. If you look at the Middle Ages, if you look at the early modern periods where, 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 where people were ready, and not just the elites, but simple people were ready to fight, to die for religious matters, for example, for, for religious questions, uh, which may seem to us today absolutely absurd, which we perhaps do not even understand because these dogmas uh, may, may seem so so surrealist to us. But for them, it was really, really important to die for your God or for your vision of, of God, to die for your country, for your king, for principle, for an oath you made, or perhaps just your leech made at one moment. And they, and they did it and they accepted it somehow because they were part of this history. And today we have dropped out of that. Not all people, but more and more people. So we are already starting to see what this post-historical man uh, may look like and, 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 and will look like. And Spengler would say, well, that's the modern, the modern fella. So, and that doesn't mean that... Um, that's also a frequent mis, mis, misunderstanding, of course, of Spengler's decline of the West, that this, this decline would be a, a punctual act of destruction of Western civilization where everything goes up in flame and then people start to, well, there isn't anything left and people live in the post-apocalyptic stage or something like that, even though Spengler wouldn't exclude that. But it's not essentially about that. The end of a civilization is not the end the abrupt end of its material uh, survival, but it's rather the fact that it may very well survive even materially, but doesn't have any any inner sense, inner logic, and that people are just living living from day to day, exactly as under the, the Roman Empire, where basically for Spengler, uh, at least since Augustus, or let's say at least after the Julio-Claudian dynasty, 
classical antiquity is finished more or less. And then afterwards, of course, people are still constructing magnificent buildings and living a nice life and recopying books and recitating poetry and doing things like that. But it is it is not anymore filled with any sense. It is out of history. And that is why it becomes then also cruder and cruder, simpler with every step. Things that are destroyed are not rebuilt anymore. People lose knowledge. And then in the end, finally, everything can crumble very quickly as it did then when the Germanic invasions uh, started. Mm. So, I mean, yeah. Perhaps this is something that Spengler would dis disagree with or say isn't a possibility. But is it a possibility or do you see it as a possibility of us moving into due to perhaps what, you know, we, we live perhaps in a state of anomaly. And this isn't me abiding by like progressivism or progress in general, but we live in an anomaly of history and technology in the sense of um, ease of ease of transport, ease of moving people around, ease of moving masses of people around, and also mass communication on a global scale. So you become this global community. Do you think there's this possibility of us moving into a history which is itself historyless? It actually sees being historyless as uh, its, its defining characteristic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That could very well happen for some decades or even some generations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be possible. I mean, um, if you look at classical antiquity, the, the the real core of of this civilization is, of course, Italy, and not even all parts of Italy, and of course Greece and a little bit of Asia Minor. That, that's the real center. All the rest that is conquered by, by by the Roman Empire is some form of periphery. These are the rests of ancient civilizations, like like Egypt. Um, they are, they, are, they are the emerging young civilization of, of Muslim civilization right in the in the east, where Muslim civilization rises in form of early Christianity first. Uh, then you have these these prehistorical societies of, of the Celts and the Germans. So they are all somehow integrated into this classical Greek or Roman Empire. And so this this is in, in some way quite an analogy to what is happening today. That is that the Western civilization has now covered the entire world, not just the Mediterranean, not just like the Greeks and Romans covered this this enormous Mediterranean space with their civilization, which was some some form of globalization. But today's globalization covers indeed the entire entire globe. So it's a difference I would say in in scale, most certainly but not necessarily in 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 essence. It, it remains the same phenomenon. It's just just larger, and uh, also um, this. Uh, in, in, in once this Western civilization dies from within, and it is already terminally ill, uh, you could say uh, sooner or later, when its real creative impetus ceases to be there then it will be extremely difficult to help to hold up uh, the uh, our degree of technology um that is already what what what, what Spengler himself by the way in his uh, seminal though very short essay uh, on on men and techniques already uh, stated that is that one day or the other quite soon not yet now but perhaps in one or two generation most gifted people will become disgusted by the civilization they will retire into some form of artificial paradises and they don't want to to continue to fight or to de develop anything new and so this 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 entire technology will first start to stagnate perhaps there will be some new applications found but there won't be anything really new uh, there would won't be a new evolution that is such a difference like uh, the, the evolution or the, the discovery of the of the airplane when you hadn't anyone that's real step forward but he, he would say it would stagnate and then more and more people will lose the knowledge of how it fits together uh, already now nobody knows really how a laptop functions uh, uh, from when nobody really understands every different different step of it it has already become much too complex for that so we we just hope that it continues to function like that we make it even a bit more complicated but nobody could now given the the different instruments start to build one from from scratch because he wouldn't wouldn't understand it uh, finally because it has become more or less more or less impossible to to do that and so sooner or later these 
there will be missing links between the different steps or between the different parts of our civilization. And so there, there will be a, a gradual process of, of simplification, of primitivization of our technology uh, until uh, it will crumble one way or the other. And one of example, once again, is, is, is ancient Rome. There, there, there too, we see on the one hand how civilization becomes simpler and simpler from the fourth century onwards. Of course, some nice buildings are still constructed, but in general, we see that everything becomes more crude. Sculpture is not at the same level than, than under Augustus, uh, for example. Um, that, that people are starting not to build new buildings, but rather to to, to just affix some form of huts to, to the walls of other buildings. So things are not rebuilt anymore, or if they are done, so they're repaired in quite not 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 not, not the same fashion like uh, like before. And then in the Roman Empire, once the the infrastructure uh, crumbles, then uh, and the the exchange network crumbles very quickly. Uh, everything declines. For example. Uh, you, you you see uh, um, in in a very uh, um, uh, con convincing way that from the fifth, sixth, seventh century onward, when the Mediterranean traffic ceases really to function, that people in northern Europe they do not have any access again to to high quality uh, ceramic roof tiles anymore, and so they can't produce them really from from themselves. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the material. So they start to put straw again on houses. They don't have any access to to olive oil, for example. So when they want to, they they, they have to go back to to beeswax, wax, for example. There's also no no access anymore to high quality uh, tiles in order to and bricks in order to bi build buildings too simply. So they they start again taking taking stones from from the environment or from from ancient ruins. So um, that is a process that takes of course quite a long time but that could be the example of how also this western machine technology as spengler calls it could given enough time crumble from itself and the other possibility which spengler outlines also uh, very drastically in men and techniques is of course the the inner resistance to western civilization by the other already dead civilizations, which nevertheless are filled, thanks to the influence of Western civilization, with resentment, with the wish to to, to somehow get rid of the, the yoke of, of Western civilization, and who try to use this Western civilization and technology in order to fight the West. That is something Spengler already thought that Eastern Asia would do, that the Muslim civilization would do, not out of their own creative impetus, which is dead already, but rather through a phenomenon of, of mirroring effect, where this, they, they, they still have enough life in them, you could say, to not to want to be subjected to Western civilization and to learn how this Western civilization functions in order to fight them. But, but once this Western civilization is then dead too, uh, they would not have uh, enough um, life in themselves to take over this technology and develop it uh, uh, independently. That, that's the end more or less of men and techniques. And that, that could be the blueprint of uh, the, the evolution from the late 20 or let's say the second half of the 21st century uh, uh, onward already now china shows us um, how, how how that could look like a non-western westernized civilization that is just poised to somehow to take over this leading role and has strongly doubt if once western civilization would be destroyed if china for example would have the knowledge or the interest or the creative energy to develop Western technology into unknown directions, or if it would then also very rapidly be become disused and just become some form of elite uh, elite games, whereas the last masses, the large masses, would still live in in in, in very uh, modest, uh, nearly medieval uh, conditions. So the ca the catalyst for the the Roman Empire was really you know even though it was on the decline it was really to do with transportation and we could say supply chains in a certain sense. That was of course very important as there was a, a, a huge division of tasks of course within these enormous empires 
and the 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 the, the security in the Mediterranean and the high quality of the Roman uh, streets uh, made it, of course, possible or, or made it economically interesting to export things from Egypt to to Gaul right? and also, of course, the Roman army who was moved around this entire empire was also an important factor of transportation of goods and services and uh, and knowledge and uh, once of course this infrastructure crumbled uh, because the different germanic tribes divided it up between themselves and then islam came and cut off one half of the mediterranean then all of that uh, crumbled very very easily and people had to to find local substitutes to high quality products came in from everywhere and they, they also just needed to um, to survive before they could live off very cheap grain coming from from Egypt or from or from Africa. But once that supply chain wasn't there anymore, they had to start uh, to start planting crops and and so on. And that was for many people from the fifth uh, sixth century on was a real disaster. You had this enormous city cities already depleted because of the different uh, pests and pandemics and so forth but still you have these enormous uh, cities with people doing all kinds of jobs but having no idea basically how to how to survive on your own how to be a farmer exactly as today is probably neither you nor me would be capable just of uh, starting to farm and to survive on our own uh, knowing what to plant exactly at what time and how to protect them against the parasites and when to reap and how to to store all that so many people at that time didn't know know that also and when the germanic invasions then broke the supply and communication chains then then we had a real uh, urban exodus where people um, started to realize that these cities they couldn't survive because no food was arriving so they started to go outside to find a plot of land start farming and they didn't succeed because they didn't know how how that functioned so there was a, a rapid decline also in uh, in population of course i'm simplifying and condensing events that happened uh, uh, not just in one or two years but over a certain period of time but it is it is eerily reminiscent uh, of or, and, and shows the complexity and fragility already of classical antique society, which was even much more robust than ours. But if you imagine something like that in our society, with things like uh, the internet suddenly not functioning anymore for for a couple of of, of months or things like that, uh, then uh, the, the, the consequences uh, or China being cutting us off from from its supply chains or whatever. The consequences would be disastrous. There would be uh, there would be mass hecatomb of people simply dying because they don't get uh, get any food and uh, would, would would try suddenly to be interested in their gardens and realize that they don't know how to plant uh, plant things. So our civilization could crumble much more quickly in a disaster scenario than than the, the one in classical antiquity. Of course, I'm not saying that this is part of Spengler's vision, because once again, his his point of view when he speaks about the decline of the West is precisely not one of a cataclysmic disaster, but rather of a, of a long-term decline and end of this creative process of, of, of each uh, culture. But once this culture or civilization becomes petrified and extinct, then uh, also catastrophic things could happen and did happen and could also happen to, 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 to us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of strange, strange that these cultures, I mean, this is a really peculiar quote. Spengler says the great events of history were not achieved by peoples, they themselves created the peoples, right? So that sounds to me like the cultures themselves are this, just an essence which is in the air and the peoples abide by it. Um, so in what sense does Spengler in that way understand causation? Yeah, yeah. As I said, uh, for we, we can try to understand these, this, this uh, project of the rise and fall of a culture a bit like a virus. So you have out of a mystery, and Spengler doesn't know himself how, how a civilization comes to comes to, to, to be born. But at one moment or the other, there, there is this idea, or rather feeling, this, this world feeling of a certain civilization. There are roots that go back in the past, of course, but there is, there is one moment where suddenly emerges this, this first step of being a civilization, or culture, or culture, as he said, it was a very special, 
vision on how things are, a certain understanding of what God is, what man is, how society should look like, a certain feeling, uh, emotional feeling that imbues everything with its specific view. And then this this evolves and, and pushes the people it has taken, you could say, uh, relentlessly and remorselessly through these thousand years of history where this world feeling is, is declinated through all the different preordained uh, steps. Uh, world feeling such as, well, the Faustian world feeling for the Western civilization, which is this feeling of, uh, of, um, of wanting to reach the horizon, be better, be stronger, be higher, to know what is happening, this, this longing for something else, this thriving uh, uh, impetus, uh, something that doesn't exist. I, I, I think Spengler is right. It doesn't exist on such a massive scale also in other civilizations. It's typically Western, this this, this uh, demesure, as, as, as uh, in, in, in French it would be called, this... Uh, uh, this, this absence of any classical proportion, this immoderation of of, uh, of, of, of a thriving. And of course, it's difficult to say when did that start for the first time? Who was the first person? Who was the, what was the first city, the first village, the first thinker to be fully immersed and to submit to this feeling and to pass it on to, to, to others? Spengler doesn't think, doesn't, doesn't really write, uh, write about that. He just say, says that why these civilizations are born must remain a mystery, exactly like it is a mystery when suddenly a flower uh, emerges from 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 the from from, from the soil, uh, so he sees that from an aesthetic point of view, but avoids a bit this question of why precisely at that moment and how is it transmitted. I'm sure that today, with our modern perhaps psychological uh, understanding of the human being and how informations, how feelings are transmitted from one generation to the other, how archetypes function, I think that. From from this discipline, or this discipline could perhaps give some 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 interesting hints uh, into that. I think there must be quite a lot in Jung uh, in order to better understand the the, the, the precise genesis and transmission of this cultural uh, uh, virus. Uh, you could uh, you could say uh, so. It remains a mystery, but so this this culture uh, then uh, shapes the civilization, and so that there are there are basically two two elements that shape a civilization. On the one hand, there's, of course, this, this idea, um, this, this, this soul, this worldview that animates a civilization, like, as I said, the Faustian longing for Western civilization, like the idea of the, the body, the Apollinian body in classical antiquity, like the, the meandering harmonious path in Chinese uh, civilization, or this inexorable straight-lined way from life to death in, in Egyptian civilization. But this 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 soul, this this worldview is also intimately linked to, to a certain landscape. It is inseparable from that. So there is there's a link between the rise of that feeling and a certain certain type of landscape. So for Spengler, for example, there is there's obviously a link between the Nile and this 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 this, this linear uh, world feeling of the of the uh, of the Egyptians or of this uh, uh, island landscape of classical Greece and the perception of of uh, the world as being separate, uh, harmoniously arranged bodies or, or the, the wide ranges of uh, of of northwestern Europe uh, with its ocean and so forth and the and, and western longing for what is beyond. Uh, this this ocean so there is a link uh, but it, it is on the other hand you can say it's not necessarily a landscape that generates also this form of soul but on the other hand it's also the soul that imposes a certain understanding of a landscape that could perhaps be seen also different uh, from from another point of view uh, western civilization sees in italy something very different than for example greek or roman civilization would see in the same landscapes when it comes to singling out what is what is remarkable in in them and then of course this civilization then shapes its different peoples of course there is a certain basis there are tribes there are societies there are perhaps already towns and so forth with perhaps different languages and and and, and, and traditions and so forth but 
the, the civilization itself then takes them over, you could say, shapes them and, and, and gives rise to them, which is also why Spengler is fundamentally opposed to any idea of race. For, for, for Spengler, uh, uh, race is something that at best stems from, or as a political term at least, that is first created by civilization, a race that is something that after generations and generations of a specific form of education, of breeding, of singling out of aesthetical qualities, then finally uh, comes to, 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 to being, but it is not, uh, it, is, uh, it, uh, it is not bio biological race that shapes any form of civilization. It's rather the other way around. It's civilization that gives rise to a certain form of, 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 of people, even from a, from a biological uh, point of view. Uh, and as for Spengler, all civilizations are radically on the same footing, are radically e equal, at least below the eye of God, you could say. Spengler wouldn't say that, but uh, he would probably say from, a, from an aesthetic point of view, the Western civilization is not better or worse than the Greco-Roman or Chinese civilization. Uh, so that is why he was, of, of course, absolutely opposed to this very crude um, tentative of of social Darwinism and, of course, of um, of, of national socialism uh, in interpreting history as the consequence of the uh, conflicts between different races and the endeavor to somehow create a hierarchy of races with the Aryan race, like in Gobineau and. Uh, subhumans uh, on another level for spengler that doesn't make any any form of sense as there is no superiority of 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 the white people linked to western civilization over the semitic people of the uh, uh, christian and 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 muslim um, civilization and that brought him of course also in in, in quite a pronounced uh, a contrast with uh, national socialism and explains why he had this uh, why they they even for forbid Spengler from publishing uh, things after their um, takeover of power so race is a term that appears in in in, in the decline of the west but as the result of uh, civilization uh, rather than being its uh, its preconditioning mm. So, where, I mean, if, if you agree that there is some sort of misconception about Spengler in that sense, that he's aligned with certain figures of that type, uh, do you think it primarily just comes from his sympathies with Mussolini and this Italian, this Italian civilization that was coming forward? Or do you think it's sort of uh, just over time something that's just grown? Well, there is the style, of course. As I said, it's very elitist. It's a dictatorial style that uh, doesn't really... Uh, fit, I would say, in the more gentle uh, form we tend to formulate scholarly books today. Uh, then there is this, this determinist view of history, which is not progressist, but which is uh, cyclical and predetermined and leads ultimately to to, to the end of, of, of something, to the dying of something that is, of course, very difficult to also to accept by, by our modern societies who tend to focus everything on on progress and, and rise and so forth. Uh, his view is, of course, very elitist, so it's not the large masses who are his interest, but essentially the elite. So that's, of course, also uh, very difficult to assume for more leftist ideology who tends to favor rather the uh, socio-economic tendencies of large masses than the work of, 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 of certain individuals. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, there is the, the problem of uh, interpreting uh, democracy. And for, for, for Spengler, um, of course, democracy as such doesn't exist. For, for, for Spengler, um, these, these constitutions as such do not mean much. Uh, it depends on at what moment of the history of a civilization they appear. Uh, and what people uh, fill them with uh, with life, and so, for example, classical Greek uh, democracy of classical Athens uh, is is not essentially understood by Spengler 
as uh, under the terms of democracy, but rather uh, under the term of in, in what phase of history it happens. And for, for, for Spengler, for example, the age of Pericles and of Athenian democracy, for him, this is an absolutist era. He says that uh, Athenian democracy is nothing else than the absolutism of the demos, and as such, its parallel is not with the democratic society since the French Revolution, but rather with the absolutist monarchic state of Louis XIV in, 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 in France. And so the Parthenon uh, is uh, somehow the equivalent, you could say, of the castle of Versailles. These are the morphological parallels he would put, put forth. So democracy per se, as such, does not necessarily have has any value. And that explains also how he sees modern democracies, as he doesn't see them at all in the, any form of continuity of, of classical Greek democracy, but rather as a form of organization of an essentially plutocratic and oligarchic uh, society, where the uh, uh, the pretension to uh, or the pretense to 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 uh, refer to, to to the people is not much more than a than a sham. By the way, he rejoins, of course, with many of his arguments, he rejoins, that is also very curious, a uh, very leftist argumentation, because Marx would have said much the same, that is democracy and invention of the bourgeoisie, uh, finally, and of a high capitalist class and becoming more and more monopole capitalist uh, uh, as far as, as, as history progresses. So Spengler would rather share that form of analysis. But of course, for Spengler, the, the ultimate aim uh, of Western civilization after this this age of plutocracy and oligarchy disguised as, as democracy is Caesarism and then the empire and not uh, the free communist uh, socialism of, uh, uh, of, 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 of a leftist worldview. And that, of course, is, is interpreted as, uh, as being profoundly anti-democratic anti by, 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 by the leftist. Of course, Another point explaining why Spengler has this reputation of being uh, being one of these forbidden authors also is that even though he underlines the radical equality of all civilizations and the fact that this imperial destiny is unavoidable and that this is the end, so it's not a positive evolution, but somehow negative because this is old age and even, even death, is the fact that he still hoped out of patriotism that this final closing empire of the Western civilization would be born by Germany rather than by the UK. Uh, for him, or, or, or the US, for him, there were only two alternatives left as Spain and France were more or less spent culturally uh, because they had already spent all their energy, uh, France in the 18th and 17th century, Spain in the 16th century. So only the, the English sphere and the German sphere was somehow still left as a as, uh, as, uh, motor for, for, for this late civilization. And he, of course, hoped that this new Roman Empire of the West would be organized around Germany rather than uh, around the UK or the US. So he hoped for that uh, out of still patriotic duty, as many of his contemporaries. And that is why he did also a bit with politics and uh, tried to, to, to exert some influence and making his theory also agreeable or acceptable uh, for uh, contemporary conservative uh, politicians whom he also advised uh, directly or indirectly how to overthrow the Weimar Republic in order to finally make Germany great again, you could say, and uh, uh, impose upon Germany something resembling Italian fascism, as he saw and thought that, uh, that Caesarism uh, some form of fascism was was unavoidable, so better accept it and impose it as soon as possible than to avoid it and then to become also a victim of, uh, of history. So that's how his determinism was linked to um, also some form of political action. And that explained, of course, why then many of the contemporaries of Spengler proceeded to to something that I would consider quite improper uh, from, a, from a scholarly point of view, uh, 
but which was perhaps unavoidable, that they changed the logic of Spengler. Spengler, I, I strongly believe that the Spengler first is convinced about the decline of the West and the unavoidability of Caesarism, and then just in the second step thinks, mm -hmm. okay, we can't escape that, so somehow we have to, to, to deal with it and make the best out of it, instead of saying, I so like illiberal and fascist regimes that I will now write 1,200 pages of a book in order to justify my political opinion and just invent all that so that I can somehow show a book in order to, to, to legitimate my political preferences. And that, unfortunately, is, is a point of view that is still, uh, still very, very widespread today, that is seeing the decline of the West as being some uh, uh, exposed justification of his personal political preferences and not the other way around. Mm. I mean, that's fairly absurd in t to, to, to hold that view in, in, in relation to the scope of the text, right? I mean, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. quite, quite a lot of effort to go to to, uh, to justify, probably at that point, somewhat commonly accepted viewpoint as well, um, to yeah. write, you know, you don't really need to write 1200 pages in those days to do so. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one other... Um, key part of uh, the volume vol of volume two which i wanted to to touch upon because i've sort of found it quite strange that he he focuses on it and perhaps you know as you've already mentioned actually of schopenhauer and nietzsche uh, nietzsche in this strain he's he's almost of the same thought in a way and i mean this is in relation to um jesus and jesus for spengler seems to go beyond uh beyond the spenglerian view of of world history and that, you know thinking about it now in that vitalist philosophy of Nietzsche and Schopenhauer even though both of those are of course completely non-religious thinkers um, they both have this sort of peculiar place for Jesus specifically Jesus Christ in their philosophy as uh, in for Schopenhauer this sort of ascetic ideal uh, of you know a way to live between boredom and suffering and then for Nietzsche he's a, you know he's an example you know he's people have often said that Nietzsche isn't a, a Christian but he is a Christ Ian Right, he has this mm -hmm. this place for for Christ. So, what what role does Jesus play for Spengler? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus does, doesn't have a big place in the decline of the West. I mean, there's this essentially a couple of pages you could say where he expresses some form of honest admiration for the personality of of of, of Jesus, his candor, his his purity, his naivety in some way, his uh, fight with himself, his idealism, and so forth. So there is certainly um, a, a positive representation of, of, of Jesus, but of course, uh, the, he, he sees Jesus essentially as a, as a historical figure. For him, Jesus is the, the beginning, the, the, the real starting moment of this, this Magian or Arabian uh, uh, civilization. There are some preparations, uh, of course, in uh, in, in, for him at least, in Zoroastrian philosophy and in, in, in Jewish messianism, uh, messianism and so forth. But for him, it's essentially with Jesus that, that, that this, this Arabian civilization really starts uh, and culminates in, in Islam. And that is, of course, something that many uh, theologians of his period were utterly shocked when reading this. Wengler even at one moment says very clearly that for a believer, uh, it is uh, it is perhaps hard to 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 realize that, but he says explicitly that Jesus is rather a phenomenon within Muslim civilization than within Western civilization, and that the real world in which Jesus lived uh, is is finally much more the intellectual or, or the, the emotional world of the Thousand and One Nights and the Quran uh, than of of Western Christianity. And that, that, that shows more or less uh, also this, this complexity of assessing the place of religion in the uh, decline of the West. Spengler himself, who, as I said, was not religious, I think even in his diaries, there's one passage where he confesses that from his 13th, 14th year of life, he said that he, 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 fin he finished with all illusions about God and religion and finished to have any religious fights within himself that he became absolutely detached from from religion uh, so um and so 
religion is something that or is a phenomenon that a little bit like technology also uh, can move from one civilization to the other, can even uh, influence some really civilizations at the same time, but which then becomes a, a different phenomenon. And, and he, exactly as he says, there are three Aristotle, he would also say where well, there, there are a couple of Christianities. There is the Christianity of the first uh, millennium, essentially entered, uh, centered around the Eastern Mediterranean basin, which is just one phase in the uh, development of the Magian or magical uh, civilization, which culminates in Islam, and so which spans roughly from the year zero to the year thousand, you could say. And then there is Western Christianity, which takes over, of course, uh, the Bible and quite a lot also of dogmas and literature, but which reinterprets them from the point of view of the Faustian uh, men and the Faustian worldview. And so it uh, takes over these texts, but sees them in a totally different point of view. And so the real historical Jesus for Spengler belongs to this Magian civilization. And so finally, you could say that the real Jesus for Spengler is, is uh, uh, the uh, beginning of an, of an evolution that culminates then in the uh, Fatimid or Seljuk Caliphate. With, with Mohammed also as one of its points, whereas the Western Christianity is in some way a, a, a misunderstanding of, of historical uh, Christianity. That's what, what Spengler would say. And so he, he uh, also uh, shows that in a, in a way that makes it perhaps easier to understand for today's reader, because we, we today we have also a very teleological image of Christianity. We live in a, in, a, in, in a period where all Eastern Christianity has more or less been eradicated. So we make this, this, this uh, we, we see Christianity as somehow synonymous with the Western civilization uh, and of very often reduce that to Catholicism, Protestantism, a little bit the Orthodoxy uh, in, in Russia and around. But uh, we do not see at all that at least in the first first millennium, Christianity was an affair of the, the Eastern Mediterranean basin and not at all of Northwestern uh, uh, Europe. Um, and so we, we tend to see a linearity where we have finally rather, rather different uh, phenomena, which becomes very clear when we consider also that Christianity, even in the beginning of Western civilization, so in the early Middle Ages, looked absolutely different from what we see today when we go into a post-Second uh, Vatican or Catholic Church or an Anglican Church or, or whatever. If someone wants to understand what medieval Christianity was about, he should read, for example, the uh, Heliant. You read, some, some, some listeners may know about this attempt uh, to um, somehow compile the different Gospels into a long uh, ancient German Saxon uh, uh, poem um, that describes the life of Jesus in, 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 in this uh, form of, of, of early High German for a Saxon public, which is still very much pagan and uh, also uh, influenced by, by Germanic traditions. And if you read this, you see that, that, that Jesus is the head of some form of, of varied, uh, of, 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 uh, of warrior tribes who who rides through the different forests from one castle to the next one, and he gives lavish uh, banquets, and they, they fight at some moment, and they are heroic act, and they all insist on 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 the on the, the strength and persuasion and force of uh, of Jesus, even the end. Uh, where, where, where where Peter uh, uh, um, then cuts the ear of uh, uh, one of the uh, people wanting to 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 imprison uh, uh, Jesus is is depainted as real medieval battle where people start to slay each other and blood is blood is flowing everywhere and they all are, are great warriors and so forth. So if if, if you read this 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 this, this poem. Um, that it, it, from, from an emotional point of view, uh, it, this is absolutely something totally different than uh, if, you, if you read one of the real Gospels from the context of the first century AD. And we have to realize that for most of the people in Northwestern Europe, when they started to become Christianized, um, that for them Christianity was basically uh, assimilated through 
through, 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 through these endeavors. They, they couldn't read themselves anything. They couldn't read the Gospels, obviously, themselves. Uh, they, 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 they were not taught about it. They heard perhaps uh, sometimes only Latin uh, some, some, some quotes during church service. So what they knew about their own religion was something very chivalric, something very heroic, something that were absolutely ahistorical, something that fitted in their own early medieval world image, and that from our point of view would seem much more pagan than what we are accustomed after a thousand years of evolution and of historical re-anchoring of, uh, uh, of Christianity. And so from that point of view, if we really look at the testimonies of, of early medieval and high medieval uh, Christianity, which is also so inseparable from chivalric ideas, uh, this is something very different from the from, from, from early Christianity. So from that point of view, you could say that Spengler indeed has, has a point and that probably the, uh, the apostles of Jesus, if they were transferred a thousand years later into some form of Germanic forest and seeing what people consider as being Christian would probably be aghast and say, well, what, what's that for a strange thing? And why, 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 why do they refer to, 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 to Christ in such a, such a weird way, which has nothing to do at all with the Jesus we experienced in, 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 in Galilea uh, uh, at the beginning of the first century? Mm -hmm. It makes me it makes me wonder, you know, with Jesus being once again, the whole story being subsumed into the Spenglerian worldview. Um, is there anything Spengler sort of sort of comments on which he he does see as an anomaly of something which he can't fit into his worldview? No, no, I don't think so. I I think that Spengler was himself so steeled in his own vitalist uh, philosophy and uh, his own view on history that he doesn't seem to have had this this impulse at looking at some form of transcendence that went beyond a simple schopenhauerian form of aestheticization of the will to power or the, the, the beauty of the fight or things like uh, things like that of course, there are germs of something transcendent in the decline of the West, which are not resolved and developed by Spengler himself. Why it is so important, I think, not to just discuss uh, the, the, the book, but also try how we could perhaps rearrange, adapt, modernize, correct uh, this, uh, this approach. And one of these elements is, this, um, is the place of, of the spirit within the decline of the West, because he very often refers to the to the notion of an idea which which is developed through these different steps. So he, he, he says that at the beginning of a civilization, a certain idea is developed. It is, goes to different stages until it then retires itself into some form of post-historical substract. But there is, I, I would say, uh, there is a certain Hegelian tinge to the decline of the West, which Spengler himself would probably have refused, saying, no, I'm not a Hegelian, and he has some very crude and uh, very harsh words uh, against Hegel, uh, but uh, it, it is very Hegelian in a certain point of view. If, if you look at the different steps through which these civilizations go, even though Spengler describes them as, as steps of, of a living being, like birth and young age and adulthood, uh, old age and death and so forth, there is a certain also tendency uh, of seeing them in a, in, a, in a certain dialectical way. You, you could, and I've tried to do that, uh, by the way, my own uh, um, endeavor to develop a philosophy of history, you can translate them quite easily into a dialectical uh, scheme with thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, with the, the, the thesis being somehow uh, the, 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 the culture, the antithesis being this rationality that then develops in the second half of the evolution uh, of, 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 of a civilization, uh, um, and then some form of synthesis in the end when it uh, when it petrifies. Already this juxtaposition of culture and civilization is somehow quite dialectical, or rather it's, it's antithetical, but, but really cries for some form of synthetical uh, resolution, which in, in 
my point of view, uh, can indeed be seen also in the last development phase of, of, of every civilization. And there are, as I said, many germs of such a dialectical reading of Spengler in the decline of the West uh, um, itself. So even though uh, Spengler himself did not put that very strongly forward, uh, there are many elements that would permit uh, perhaps more satisfyingly a metaphysical reading of the decline of uh, of the West, and that that's why I so often appeal to people to to stop seeing this book, as many others also, as just an antiquarian testimony of uh, a period hundred years ago, and to just read that in the context of Weimar and these silly conservative peoples and uh, influenced by uh, by by people by by person A and then uh, received by person person B afterwards, but rather in 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 seeing this this enormous comparison between different uh, civilizations as, as something that can indeed be verified or falsified by 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 reality by historical research, and if um, uh, many of these comparisons are correct from a historical point of view, and I think they are. Then we should somehow say, okay, well, then, then 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 we should take that over and try to develop it ourselves and take that a little bit like in natural science, where we also wouldn't just say, okay, we read Einstein uh, as a testimony of the 1910s or 1920s or whatever, but we we read him for theorems that can still be applied or falsified or updated uh, today. That is something we should do with Spengler, as I'm convinced that there are many elements in Spengler that are not yet, perhaps, but not falsified by history, and which give an extremely interesting clue to understanding even our present and our future. And we should really take that over and think where Spengler erred, where Spengler had approaches which were perhaps not acceptable also uh, from a philosophical point of view and see how we can how we can update and uh, him and, and and progress somehow beyond his own uh, point of uh, point of view. Is uh, our, our studies of Spengler's work growing, or is there is there increased interest? Mm, I think well after after the the Second World War there has been decline in interest very notably in in, in this Cold War context he he seemed also. Um, uh, somehow uh, antiquated, uh, as uh, this this didn't seem to to fit in very well into his his predictions. And then, since the fall of communism, of course, and then since the the new multipolar world that is emerging, and all these different cultures again becoming so important, like the Muslim world, like China, like so forth, this more culturalist point of view has become ever more convincing and given the obvious decline of Western civilization, which seems to be in, in full dissolution uh, for the moment, of course, the decline of the West becomes ever more more interesting. And so, yes, um, uh, I, I would say that uh, since uh, for the last 20 years or so, there has been increased interest in, in, in Spengler, uh, scholarly interest also. Uh, of course, I'm a little bit... Uh, to say, uh, perhaps not objective enough as I found it myself, this, this Oswald Spengler Society and we're editing a journal and uh, regularly organizing conferences and so forth. So so I couldn't say there are things are happening because I'm, I'm also with the, the organizers of them somehow. So I'm not absolutely, uh, to say, uh, uh, um, uh, blameless in order mm. to to make people speak about about Spengler, but even outside now of my own activities, there there, there is an increased uh, an increased interest. Not yet as much as there should be, I think, but at least we see that his approach is uh, more and more taken over by uh, by the historical disciplines, often without acknowledging. Uh, the, uh, the the relevance of Spengler. So uh, the um, comparatist approach to what is comparing Rome and China or ancient India or all this intercultural study uh, studies and so forth, uh, they very often confirm uh, many of Spengler's intuitions uh, without necessarily acknowledging it, perhaps, perhaps even without knowing that Spengler already wrote the same things a uh, uh, hundred years ago. Um, but there is definitely an increase in, in comparative studies in history, uh, which does not contradict Spengler, but to the contrary, uh, confirms 
quite a lot of 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 his different points and there's also an increased interest in in, in Spengler's work uh, uh, as such but what is still missing even though I'm trying to push that of course is a critical yet constructive uh, approach towards Spengler critical acknowledging what is factually wrong but constructive in order to say how can we take Spengler's method in order to repair or, 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 or make it function better from the from the from the within because there are a couple of of, of, of errors in Spengler like for example the fact that uh, Spengler thought that uh, ancient Iran ancient Persia uh, was somehow a part of what he calls the Magian civilization uh, uh, and I'm deeply convinced that ancient Iran is a civilization of its own starting with the Achaemenids and ending with the Sasanians so that that shapes of that, that, that changes of course the outlook on on the Magian civilization which then finished somewhere uh, in Mesopotamia and not in in Afghanistan you could say and that solves also quite a lot of trouble and of theological issues linked to the understanding of this 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 Magian civilization also convinced that we do not have just one Chinese civilization but that we have two Chinese civilizations an ancient one uh, that is uh, essentially uh, uh, that it finish with the, the, the Han dynasty uh, with its its native uh, form of ritualistic uh, polytheism and then the second one that starts uh, more than half uh, a millennium later uh, and that is organized around the uh, import of Buddhism that doesn't center in the plains of the north but rather the landscape of, of southern China that would explain of course also the still extraordinary resilience of China today because China wouldn't then be a dead civilization since more than 2000 years, like Spengler believed, but rather only since a couple of centuries. And so quite still resilient, exactly as was the Roman Empire in the second century uh, AD. And so there are, there are quite some, of, some, some, some aspects where, as I said, we can solve a number of issues undoubtable un issues within Spengler's philosophy by applying his own method, but by, by updating him. And I think that is, at least for me, that is deeply rewarding and that solves quite a lot of, of historical issues. So that's really a method I can invite everyone also, the historian or so on, that, that would hear uh, this, this, this talk to, to try to engage in, 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 in this approach. Uh, we do not need to believe uh, every word Spengler, Spengler says it is absolutely possible to take over certain elements and to reject others uh, in order to build upon him and to, to develop uh, his work. Many civilizations and many informations were also not accessible to him. For example, he had no idea or no real idea about the outline of Southeastern um, Asia and about the, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, impressive uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, creations of the uh, Khmer uh, Empire uh, and Cambodia because it, they only started slowly to discover them in at that period and of course the the, the uh, Mayan uh, hieroglyphs were not yet uh, yet deciphered at that moment and the Andean uh, civilization was bar barely known to, to to Spengler so he he just wrote I think. Uh, in total four or five sentences about the Incas because he didn't really know much about, about them. So history has progressed uh, a lot since then. And I think that many of this information uh, can be, or much of this information can be included into uh, Spengler's way of, of reasoning in order to maintain this, this, uh, this, uh, this system, which is, as I said, extremely fertile and at least for me, very convincing still today. Um, so yeah, I mean, in, in relation to you know, if a historian was interested, where or, or if other people were interested, you obviously uh, founded this society. Um, where, whereabouts would people get uh, get involved if they they you know? I mean, I imagine it's probably quite difficult for for some people in the English speaking world to find somewhere where which is uh, Spengler sympathetic. Yeah, yeah, I think our society will probably be the best way to start as we uh, uh, are essentially in English uh, functioning in in in, in English. Uh, of course, our activities uh, are, are still modest to to the degree that yes, we we publish this this regular journal, 
uh, every every few years or so when we have enough articles and and review. Uh, we try to organize also every two years a larger conference, uh, which is then always uh, also published. We we um, award also an Oswald Spengler Prize to chosen personalities that are uh, somehow linked to to Spenglerian thought. Uh, so in 2018, for example, it was uh, Michel Welbeck who received the first Spengler Prize. Or uh, in 2020, it was Walter Scheidel. Uh, the, the, the great uh, comparatist historian from Stanford University who received them this year. Uh, there will also be a quite well-known uh, intellectual, uh, probably even North American intellectual, who will receive this this third uh, uh, Spengler, Spengler Prize. So yeah, we try to be to be active uh, to integrate people interested in the work of Spengler. We nevertheless we do not want to be a Spengler fan club. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Uh, we, we welcome also any form of, of, of critical analysis of Spengler, be it his life, be it his worldview, be it his political opinions, be it his historical errors. So it's not about showing that Spengler was always right, but rather uh, about uh, yeah, studying, of course, his context and his life and whatever, uh, but also being open to, to, to whatever didn't fit in or where he erred or where he... Uh, uh, perhaps also took some some shortcuts uh, from 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 historical evidence. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, everyone of course is is welcome to to join our modest activities. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, David Engels. I think that's uh, a good place to finish up. Um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on. Thank you very much for for invitation. It was a pleasure again. <laughs>